This is Ask GMBN Tech, our weekly tech Q&A session. If you've got any questions you'd love to ask us, get involved in the comments section underneath and use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Alternatively, you can email them to hellotech at gmbn.com. Okay, over to sick Lister bike now. How do positive and negative narrow wide chain rings work? Um, do you mean by positive and negative just literally the size of the narrow and wide? chain ring teeth profile, I, I think you probably do. If that's the case, literally, if you have a look at one of those chain rings, you'll see a narrow chain ring tooth and you'll see a wide chain ring tooth and they're basically staggered like that. Now, if you look at a chain, you look at the way the links work, you have the pins, you have the rollers, you have the inner plates and the outer plates. You'll note that the gap between the inner plates is thin and the gap between the outer plates is wider. And basically this is just to correlate with the narrow wide chain ring teeth. Now the reason, if you had a conventional chain ring and a conventional chain and you're riding along, basically the chain can rattle around on that chain ring and it will tend to unwind from the bottom on rough terrain and then eventually drop off. So the logic behind having a narrow wire chain ring is to sandwich the chain and chain ring together. So basically the chain won't vibrate and it's far less likely to actually come off or derail in the first place. So added to this, you also have the increased height of the actual chain ring teeth themselves, which on previous original chain rings wouldn't really extend above the height of the chain. But if you look at narrow wide style chain rings, it actually pushes above. And the reason for that is the chain can still move around even with narrow wide technology, but it's basically to enhance the fact that the chain's not gonna come off quite as easily. Now, the final piece of this puzzle is by having a clutch derailleur. Because as we know through bumpy terrain when you're pedaling, if you've got a derailleur or a chain guide on the top, the chain will not come off there. But the bottom, when a chain is flapping around, this is the piece of the chain that's not tensioned as much because your cranks don't have an effect on that. The chain can unwind from the bottom. But with the clutch derailleur, it puts more tension on the bottom lower part of the chain, and that further increases the fact that the chain is gonna stay on and stay retained on that chain ring. It's a really, really good system. And actually, the more you look at it, the more simple it actually becomes. Now, this is a cool one from the mates. Now with the release of SRAM Access, is or are cheaper DIY versions of wireless shifter shifting still worth it? In particular, the Archer Components D1X. Now this is really cool, I've totally forgotten about the Archer system and I've not actually used it myself. Um, so in case you don't know, the Archer system basically is two wireless units, there's a shifter and there is a slave unit that mounts on a chainstay of your bike, the cable from your derailleur then goes into it and the wireless unit communicates with the shifter. So you're doing away without the cables However, you still need your conventional rear derailleur, which is both the key to the success of the system, but also it's a bit of a vice, a bit of an Achilles heel too, because the whole reason the SRAM access system is so good is the fact that it has no cables, has no wires. It is cleaner, faster shifting. It's a very, very different system and actually not comparable. However, I love what the Archer system is doing. I'm actually keen to try this myself because it certainly cleans up the whole look at the front end of your bike. You've just got a push button system on there. But really, I don't think that DIY systems are gonna compete with something like the SRAM Access system because what that offers and what it's gonna offer with other product releases coming in the future, and the fact that they can all integrate together, it's gonna to be like an ecosystem. So your watch, your Garmin style device, you know, all your smart devices are gonna be able to communicate, you can be able to customize them, it's gonna learn from you, it's gonna figure out your riding patterns and what your optimal chaming size is, what gear you use too much, perhaps you need to lower or higher your cadence. There's gonna be so many things it's gonna be able to do. And whilst the Archer system is really cool and really admirable that you can have a wireless shifting system for far less money, I think it's a total different kettle of fish compared to the SRAM access system. So really, in my opinion, if you're gonna go electronic and you're going wireless, I think you go the whole hog. Um, but that said, I really, really like what Archer have done with that system and it's very cool. Okay, next one from Domingo Rain. Is it possible to run SRAM Eagle GX with an NX cassette and race face cranks and chainring? Um, yeah, provided your NX is the 12 speed one uh, because there's also NX 11 speed. You can use 11 speed stuff with 11 speed and 12 speed with 12 speed, but not the other way around. SRAM, of course, they would recommend, just like Shimano would, that you use their components with their own components with uh, to get like optimal shifting and performance. 
but there are plenty of options out there on the market. And you've only got to look at brands like YT that hand spec specific parts of the transmission to what they want to spec. Go for it. Good old classic from MTB Love here. Dottie, can you take us through the pros and cons of press fit bottom brackets? Seems like the majority of people don't really care for them, yet more manufacturers, YT and Canyon for example, seem to be including them in new bike kits, and I'm wondering why. Loving the show, and thanks for, you, for everything you do to help keep our rigs trail ready. Um, well, first up, thank you for the props, and then secondly, yeah, let's get into press fit. So this age-old argument. So where did it start, firstly? So really, you've got Cannondale to thank for that, for helping develop BB30. So this essentially had a bigger axle and bigger bearings and doing away with a bottom bracket shell uh, screwing type cups that we're familiar with. And they did this by having machined bearing surfaces as part of the frame. So they were machined into the frame on aluminium frames and it was a big aluminium insert that would be machined and then included and basically bonded into carbon frames. Super expensive to make because the tolerances had to be so precise. If any element was out, the bearings would just fall to bits straight away. So they had to be perfect. Now this is a really, really cool system and it actually saved a bit of weight, increased rigidity and did a whole bunch of other things, but it's extremely expensive. So then the next step was to make a cheaper version. And the way to do that was by making nylon cups and putting the bearings in them and then those cups could press fit into frames. Now by doing that, the frame manufacturing process could also have less stages in it and be a lot cheaper. You think of the machining and intricacies that have to go into doing things like machining bearing surfaces. If you're not having that as part of your frame development, your frame can be produced faster. And in mass production, time is money. So really that's one of the major reasons why people use PressFit because really what you're doing as a frame manufacturer is saving on tooling, saving on time on that production line so you can get more frames out. And also you're putting the job of the bottom bracket construction into the bottom bracket company, not your own frame building company. So I'm just gonna throw some pros and cons on screen. So first up, the pros. The frame is easier and cheaper to manufacture. Threaded bottom bracket shells require tapping. And whilst this isn't really a hard thing to do, it requires specific tooling and it does take more time. As I mentioned, time is money when it comes to manufacturing. So the beauty of the press fit frame is that the bottom bracket fit really is down to the bottom bracket manufacturer, not the frame manufacturer, which means the frames cost less for the manufacturer and it costs less for you, the consumer, which is why brands like Canyon and brands like YT offer press fit bottom brackets and you get more bang for your buck. So in theory, everyone's happy. Also, the press fit bottom brackets themselves are fairly cheap to replace. Okay, so there are quite a few cons with press fit bottom brackets. Now, if there's poor tolerance between nylon cups and the frame, then you're gonna get movement which occurs. And any movement that occurs in press fit bottom brackets, that's where noise is gonna happen. And the same can occur if the bearings themselves can move within the actual cups, and that's called walking. If that happens, there's gonna be movement created by the torque and the weight of your body going through those cranks. It all equates to creaking. And once one of those nylon bottom brackets has started creaking, it's always gonna creak whatever you do because they will deform. So that'll be time for a new one. However, if they're installed correctly in the first place, it can be absolutely fine. Now to install them correctly, you need a primer. Basically you need to prime the bottom bracket shell with that. And then you also need a bottom bracket retaining compound. It's effectively like a combination between super glue and thread lock. It's a very specific product to bond those cups into your frame and then they will not creak. I've had many bikes I've had press fit on, they're absolutely fine. Don't get me wrong, I've had some that do creak as well. And I've always been able to cure them by installation. However, I think more than the fact that press fit bottom brackets can create problems if they're not installed correctly, or if they just deform and creak at a later date, I think people would just like the fact that a screw in bottom bracket cup is more of a fit and forget item. It's a bit more mechanical in the way it operates. Easy to understand, easy to get your head around, and nice and cheap to replace too. Okay, fork related now from Brad Williams. I've got an opportunity to replace my 2015 Fox Factory Fit 32 120mm travel for a 2017 Fox Stepcast 32 100mm travel at a deeply discounted price. I'm five foot nine, 200 pounds, and ride a Santa Cruz Tallboy 29er that was originally specced with the 120mm. What are the negatives to making a switch? Are there any? 
Um, well, first up, the Stepcast is an amazing bit of kit. It's a super lightweight, minimal fork. And like you say, it's got 100 millimeters of travel. I don't think they make that in a 120, and I don't think you can convert it to a 120. It's a 100 mil XC biased fork. Now that is, as far as I'm concerned, the only downside because your frame, correct me if I'm wrong, has 110 millimeters of travel out back. So firstly, having an imbalance of travel, I think you would always want slightly more travel on the front than you would on the rear. Uh, just creates a slightly be better balance on the trail. So having slightly short travel up front might not be the best. Now in this case, the fork is uh, 20 millimeters more travel that you've currently got and you want to go to a fork with 20 millimeters less. Now the axle to crown measurement, which is the top of the fork to the bottom of the fork, unsurprisingly, is going to be about 20 millimeters shorter, which does mean you're going to be increasing your head angle by about a degree, so it's going to get steeper. Now, a slightly steeper head angle by a degree, you might not think that's a lot, but it is definitely noticeable. Some people will really like that because it does make the bike feel more agile, but it can also make it feel more nervous. It all depends what you're happy with. And now you'll also be lowering your bottom bracket height. Now again, this might be marginal, it might just be like five millimeters, but to some people that can make a big difference to, to handling if you're, for example, running long cranks and you're riding in the area that's got lots of rocks where you need to keep pedaling, you're gonna ground your pedals out more often. Granted, you can get used to this, but in all honesty, as good as that step cast is, I'm just not convinced it's the right fork for you. And there's nothing wrong with your 120mm travel fit 32. Um, if you feel like you want more performance out of it, what about looking into getting it custom tuned for yourself? Because um, you can definitely alter the way it feels by having the same product and it'll cost you a lot less than getting that brand new fork. Alternatively, if you're dead set on getting that fork, um, what about considering getting another frame to match it? I don't think stepping down to 100 mil on that bike is the best thing to do. I think you might ruin the handling of it. Jamble 7K, grease or oil on free hub pulls? Some say thin oil, some say a light grease. Um, I would always say a thin oil myself. Uh, and if you don't wanna use a specific bike oil on there, I hear that sewing machine oil is the one to use. Now you can get a specific free hub uh, body oil out there. This is it on the screen. It's made by Demontech and it's very similar to what Mavic provide with some of their hubs. But there's also, so Shimano on the screen right there, you see the Shimano and DT both make very light greases for their free hub bodies to use with pulls. Um, myself, I would always go for oil because I fear pulls getting clogged up and not doing their job properly, not gripping. And I've had this happen before in the past where my pulls have got clogged up and I've been over the bars because of this, because they've not gripped when they should retract and grip properly. Um, so I would go for the oil myself. One this week is from Tommy Estrada. First off, let me start by saying I've been watching and a subscriber from the first GMBN Tech episode. Love this stuff. Thank you, Tommy. That's wicked to hear that you've been watching since the beginning. That's, that's super cool. Thank you. Um, my question is, I'm looking for a set of eight speed Shimano shifters to replace some old grip shift shifters. My drivetrain is all XT and I was wondering if you thought the new Acera or Altus shifters will work as well as old XTs taking into account that trickle down theory or would you happen to have any other suggestions? Um, okay, so Acera and Altus is more at the budget end. Now they're definitely gonna work really well and certainly gonna work um, better than stuff of that quality like Olivia would have been back in the day of your 8-speed XT. However, you are going to notice it's going to feel a little bit baggier, it's going to feel a little bit more vague compared to the usual XT performance, which is quite punchy, it's got that workhorse type feel. So I'm not convinced it's going to be the best like for like if that's what you're looking for. My option, I had a quick look on eBay, you can still get some XT rapid fire 8-speed shifters out there and get reconditioned ones. There's not a lot of stuff that goes wrong on them. Once they're serviced, they're taken apart, they're cleaned, they're greased. They can keep going for a very long time. So actually my advice would be to try and get some decent second-hand ones. Um, good luck with that. I hope you manage to find some. Um, if you're struggling, ping us an email and I can direct you in a few places. You might be able to find something like that. For a couple more videos, click down here for press fit bottom bracket maintenance and click down here for wheel care. And that deals with a few things, including making sure your pools are nicely oiled and they're gonna operate safely. As always, don't forget to subscribe and share our content and don't forget to give us a huge thumbs up if you love us.